Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth module of Statistics and Probability full course. My name is Sumit Shukla, a senior data scientist and an educator. In this particular video, we'll be talking all about hypothesis testing. So let's get started. So till now we have talked about uh, descriptive statistics, we talked about probability, and we have also looked at how we can use inferential statistic to approximate the population parameter given the sample statistic. So this is all what we have covered. Now we are going to start with hypothesis testing. Now uh, I have already given you uh, with the a brief idea behind what hypothesis testing is. So when we started this video, uh, we briefly discussed about all the three major buckets what is descriptive statistics, what is inferential statistics, what is hypothesis testing. But in this section, we are going to have a detailed conversation regarding what exactly is hypothesis testing and how this can be useful when it comes to data science or when it comes to data analysis. So let's start this discussion. Now to understand hypothesis testing, we will take one example. So let's say um, there is a court. So let's say this particular person is the judge sitting in the court. So judge in the court. And we have two lawyers and we have the person who has been convicted. So this person has been charged, charged for some crime. Let's say this person is talking in favor of the convicted person and this person is the against the person. Now, if I ask you, what will be the thought process this judge will be having in his or her mind regarding this particular person who has been charged for some crime, you guys can easily say that uh, the judge will be having two assumptions or maybe two hypotheses or two thought process. If I, if I tell you, like if we think in general English, it would be two thought process. Either the person is guilty or the person is innocent, right? So that is what the judge will also be having in their mind. So, either the person is guilty or uh, the person is innocent. Now, judge will decide after listening to both the lawyers, uh, uh, the particular lawyer who is talking in favor of the charged person and then another lawyer who is talking in favor of in the against the uh, charged person. So the judge will listen to both these parties and then they will declare or they will come to a particular conclusion, right? Now this is basically, uh, you can say this is basically the framework of what hypothesis testing is. So in hypothesis testing, we have two thought process, two assumptions, and we try to conclude, we try to uh, prove one of them. This is a very raw definition. This is not 100% correct, but the reason I am talking in this way is because I wanted to uh, create a base of what exactly is hypothesis testing. So just keep this example in your mind and whenever somebody is asking you what ex exactly is hypothesis testing, you can just generate this picture in your mind that there is a courtroom, there is a judge who is listening to both the lawyers, one in favor and one in against, and there is a convicted person. Now, either the person is guilty or the person is innocent. These are the two hypotheses that the judge will be having in their mind. After listening to the whole uh, whole conversation between these two lawyers, 
the judge will come to a conclusion and that is what the conclusion which we are trying to achieve right so the complete hypothesis framework is having two stages number one is to formulate the hypothesis so given a problem statement we have to formulate the hypothesis so formulation formulation of the hypothesis and number two is the test so we will perform the test to uh, to reject or to fail to reject one of the hypothesis now please don't worry about the term which I have just said reject or fail to reject but just just remember that we will first formulate the hypothesis given a problem statement so let's say your manager has given you a problem statement you will first formulate the hypothesis and then you will perform the test based on the test result you will make some conclusions so this is the simple process of hypothesis testing so the next step step is testing or performing test and then finally conclusion now let's understand the formulation of hypothesis as i have just told you that this judge this judge would be having two thought process in his mind or in their mind uh, either the person is guilty or the person is innocent now there is a formal word or there is a formal name given to these two thought process one is known as the null hypothesis and another one is known as the alternate hypothesis null and alternate hypothesis now what is null hypothesis now if I ask you before this person was charged charged for some crime before this person was taken to the court initially this person was innocent right so null hypothesis talks about the initial state of anything or initial state of the particular uh, particular uh, item or particular case that we are trying to test so null hypothesis is basically the initial state of the case we are trying to test so the initial state of this person is that this person was innocent before this person was taken to the court before this person was charged for some crime this person was innocent before anything happened to him he was innocent so so my null hypothesis is uh, the person is so h naught so null hypothesis can also be represented as h naught the person is innocent now the alternate hypothesis is what new thing has been happened what new we are trying to prove the new thing that has happened to this person is this person has been charged for crime now so this is the new thing or new state or the claim of the case we are trying to test we are trying to prove so h a alternate hypothesis can be represented as h a and in this case it will be the person is the person is guilty so this is how we can formulate the hypothesis please remember null hypothesis represents the initial state of the person or initial state of the case which we are trying to test and alternate hypothesis is basically the new finding the new thing or maybe not the new happening which uh, for the particular case which we are trying to prove or which we are trying to test
Now let's take few examples just to understand how we can formulate hypothesis uh, given any problem statement. So right now this was not the problem statement. This was a very uh, plain example. But now we will be looking at some problem statements which will have some sample mean, population mean, standard deviation to understand how we can formulate the hypothesis. Now before we talk about some business examples uh, to better understand how to formulate the null and alternate hypothesis, uh, we will understand a very small, a very small topic, uh, which, which is really important when we conclude. So whenever we conclude the hypothesis testing during conclusion, we say that we reject null or either we say that we fail to reject null. Now we never say that we accept null or we accept alternate. So what we never say, we never say, we never say we accept null or we accept alternate. Now there is a reason for this. So this is the something which I should uh, mark in red color because this is wrong. We never say this. Now the very first thing that we should understand is why are we only rejecting null and fail to reject null? Why it is only null? Why it is not alternate? Well the reason is because null hypothesis is something that we know, that we certainly know. So we are 100% sure that this person was innocent before committing crime, right? Or before the person was charged for the crime, which uh, in the court, somebody is trying to prove, right? So reason we conclude on the null hypothesis is because Null hypothesis is the statement which we are certain about. We know that initially this is something which actually happened. The person was actually innocent and we are certain about it. We are 100% certain about it. Now why we don't say accept null? If I say accept null, we are completely ignoring the fact that the person was guilty. Now it might be because of the lack of evidence. So if I say I accept null, I am 100% sure that the person was innocent. It might be because of lack of evidence. It might be because, uh, so let's say this person who is talking against the charged person, he was not able to present enough evidence against the court due to which he was not able to prove that the person is guilty. So when I say that I accept a null, I am basically ignoring the fact and I'm 100% certain that this person is innocent and I'm ignoring the fact that this person is guilty, which is not true. We have to be uncertain. We have to uh, keep some uncertainty. So the uncertainty is the lack of evidence. We, when we say that I reject null, I am saying that I am rejecting null, but I am not saying I am accepting null. Rejecting null means I am, I am not hundred percent sure, and it might be because of the lack of evidence. Now, when I say, when I say, when I, when I say accept alternate, the reason why I don't say accept alternate. So accept alternate basically mean that I'm 100% sure that the person is guilty. Now again, this th there is a there might be the lack of evidence, the person who is talking in favor of this person was not able to collect event enough evidence to prove that this person was innocent or this person is innocent. So again, uh, when we say we accept alternate, we are completely ignoring the fact that there is some uncertainty that can happen. So in order to make sure that while we are concluding something, we have the 
uncertainty in our decision and there are chances or there are possibilities of other thing happening because of the lack of evidence we only say that we either reject null or we fail to reject null i hope this makes sense uh, if it is not making sense just remember one thing we do, we only say reject null or fail to reject null we only use the null hypothesis because we are 100% sure that null was true null happened null happened in reality this person was innocent in reality that is the reason we use null the second reason why we do not say accept uh, accept null or accept alternate is because uh, is because there might be lack of evidence due to which i was not able to prove the statement so in order to include the uncertainty in my conclusion we only reject or fail to reject null i hope this makes sense now given a particular problem statement how we can formulate the null and alternate hypothesis so in this particular question uh, it states that a restaurant owner installed a new automatic drink machine the machine is designed to dispense 530 ml of liquid on medium size setting now what is the initial state of this machine so we know that the machine was designed to dispense 530 ml this is the initial state of the machine so let me just highlight this this is the initial state of the machine the owner suspects that the machine may be dispensing too much in medium drink they decide to take a sample of 30 medium drink to see if the average amount is significantly greater than 530 ml now what the owner wants to test if the average amount is greater than 530 ml so this is the new finding new finding so my alternate hypothesis is that the average amount is greater than 530 ml my null hypothesis will be the average amount is less than or equal to 530 ml now why i am using less than or equal to now please remember in the question it says the machine is designed to dispense 530 ml of liquid so i i should have written null as average is equal to 530 ml but please remember one thing i hope you guys remember when we were talking about continuous random variable and the distribution of continuous random variable we know that the point prob probability is zero so is equal to 530 ml let's say this line this line is 530 ml now greater than 530 ml is this region above the line everything is greater than 530 ml right this is greater than now if i use alternate as greater than 530 ml and null as is equal to 530 ml i will never be considering this region right the lower region and that would not be uh, that would not be helping us to arrive at a conclusion right so for example if i am getting a value which is lying below 530 ml then in that case if i do not consider this area i would not be able to conclude anything so that is the reason in order to make sure that i am covering up the complete uh, distribution we use less than or equal to so we get this part also and then we will will be able to cover up the complete uh, area under the curve there is one rule also the rule of hypothesis testing that when we talk about or when we formulate the null hypothesis the null hypothesis always uh, have they will always be having uh, less than equal to sign greater than equal to sign or equal to sign while alternate will always have less than greater than or not equal to there this is rule number 1 rule number 2 is null and alternate are 100% opposite to each other 
so null and alternate are hundred percent opposite to each other which basically means if in my uh, hypothesis formulation if I get my alternate as less than this will be greater than or equal to if this is greater than this will be less than or equal to if this is not equal to this will be equal to this is my alternate this is my null the third rule is always start by formulating alternate always start by formulating alternate now these are the three rules which so if you remember them you can formulate the hypothesis for any given problem let's try to look into second problem a city had an unemployment rate of seven percent now this is my initial state this is something which is initially given to us that we all know in the in the complete uh, city that unemployment rate is seven percent the mayor pledged to lower this figure and supported program to decrease unemployment a group of citizens want to test if the unemployment rate has actually decreased so now what we want to test or what is my new finding now new finding is that the unemployment rate has to be decreased it has to go down or it has to go below seven percent so I will start by writing my alternate hypothesis, which is average less than 7%. The opposite of this average greater than or equal to 7% would be my null hypothesis. Let's take one more example. E-health insurance claimed that in 2011, the average monthly premium paid for individual health coverage was $183. This is the initial statement made by the company. So this is my initial claim or initial state, initial. Suppose you are suspicious that the average or mean cost is actually higher. Now the new finding, the new thing that you wanted to test is uh, the average is actually higher than this number. So my alternate, the average is greater than $183. Null, the average is less than or equal to $183. Simple. Let's take one more example. We want to test whether the mean GP of students in American college is different from 2.0. Now this is what we want to test. In this question, we are not given with the initial state. So we know the alternate that average is not equal to 2.0. Null will be the average is equal to 2.0. In an issue of new US, uh, in an issue of US News and World Report, an article on school standard stated that about half of the students in France, Germany and Israel take advanced placement exam and third pass. The same article state that 6.6% of US students take advanced placement exam and 4.4% pass. Test if the percentage of US students who take advanced placement exam is more than 6.6%. So there is a magazine or there is some report which already stated that 6.6% of US students take advanced placement exam. You want to test that if this number is more than 6.6%. So what you are interested in testing, the alternate will be average is greater than 6.6% while null is average is less than or equal to 6.6%. Okay, last question. A survey was conducted to get an estimate of proportion of smokers among the graduate student. Report says 38% of them are smokers. So there is a report which says 38% of the graduate students are smokers. Now this is the initial state. This is already given in the in some report. This is already proven. But now Chatterjee doubts the result. Now we have a new finding. This person is suspicious. The person says Chatterjee doubts the result think that the actual proportion is less than this. So there is a benchmark 38%. There is a new finding in the Chatterjee. Chatterjee is thinking that uh, the actual proportion is less than 38%. So what is alternate? That the average is less than 38%, which is what Chatterjee thinks. While the report says it is greater than or equal to 38%. This is my null and alternate hypothesis. 
So I hope now you guys are clear with the first stage of hypothesis testing, which is how to formulate the null and alternate hypothesis given a particular business statement. Now let's try to understand what are the various types of test we have in the hypothesis testing topic. There are two kinds of test. Uh, number one is known as the Z test. The second one is known as the T test. Now within Z test, we have two methods. One is known as the confidence interval, confidence interval estimation or confidence interval test, also known as the Z test or the Z value method. Then we have significance test. also known as the p-value method. So within z-test, we have z-value method and the p-value method. Within t-test, we have three, uh, three types of test. So these are the two methods to perform z-test. But within t-test, we have three type of test based on the problem statement. Number one is one sample t-test. Second one is paired sample t-test. And the third one is independent sample t-test. So these are the three type of test within the t-test. If I have to perform t-test, we have three type of test based on the business or problem statement. So three type of test based on the problem statement. Okay. Now, when to use Z test, when to use T test. So I will first talk about when to use Z test. And when we will be starting the T test, I will talk more about when to use T test. So when to use Z test, you have to check for two things. Number one, the number of observations in, in your sample, in the sample, should be more than 30. And the second condition is, The population standard deviation is known. Now please remember this is a very important interview question. A very common interview question about what is the difference between Z test and T test. I'm just talking about Z test as of now. When we start the T test, I will show you the rules of when to use a T test. But Please remember, this is a very important topic. This is a very common interview question, the difference between Z-test and T-test. So if I do not know the population standard deviation and I know the sample standard deviation, but my sample size is more than 30, then still Z-test is applicable. Now, directly jump to a problem statement. Let's formulate the hypothesis apply the Z-test and let's try to conclude. In this question, we are given with a sample of 40 new milk packet had an average milk content of 92.67. So within a milk packet, you will find out some quantity of milk and some quantity of water. So it has been given that a sample of 40 new milk packet had an average milk content of 92.67 with a standard deviation of 1.79. So this standard deviation is the sample standard deviation. Now, since my sample size is more than 40, Z test is applicable over here. Use 0.05 significance level to determine if there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the new batch have milk content different from 92.84. Now, as of now, the complete question may be sounding um, really German to you. Don't worry about it. Let's try to decode this particular problem. So assume that 
यू वर्क एज ए क्वालिटी टेस्ट यू वर्क एज ए लेट से एज ए साइंटिस्ट इन द क्वालिटी टेस्ट डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ दिस मिल्क प्रोड्यूसिंग फैक्ट्री और मिल्क पैकेट फैक्ट्री सो यू वर्क एज ए साइंटिस्ट इन द क्वालिटी टेस्ट डिपार्टमेंट क्वालिटी टेस्ट डिपार्टमेंट एंड ए ऑन द डेली बेसिस लेट से दिस फैक्ट्री ऑन द डेली बेसिस इज प्रोड्यूसिंग वन लाख मिल्क पैकेट वन लाख मिल्क पैकेट सो ऑन द डेली बेसिस दिस फैक्ट्री इज प्रोड्यूसिंग वन लाख डेली पैकेट नाउ एज ए साइंटिस्ट इट इज कंप्लीटली इम्पॉसिबल फॉर यू टू टेस्ट ऑल द मिल्क पैकेट राइट सो वॉट इज द करेक्ट प्रोसीजर वी हैव ऑलरेडी लर्न अबाउट इट वी विल टेक अ सैम्पल आउट ऑफ इट सो लेट से ऑन द डेली बेसिस यू आर टेकिंग अ सैम्पल ऑफ फोर्टी मिल्क पैकेट सो लेट से आई हैव जस्ट ड्रॉन अ टेबल ऑन माई स्क्रीन लेट से दिस रिप्रेजेंट द डे इन द मंथ सो डे ऑफ द मंथ ऑन दिस रिप्रेजेंट्स द एवरेज मिल्क क्वान्टिटी सो लेट से ऑन डे वन द एवरेज मिल्क क्वान्टिटी सो ऑन डे वन यू सैम्पल्ड आउट फोर्टी मिल्क पैकेट्स आउट ऑफ the population of 1 lakh milk packet that was produced on that particular day you sampled out 40 random milk packets after performing the test on all those 40 packets the average milk content came out to be let's say 92.5 then on another day the average came out to be 92.7 on another day the average came out to be let's say 92. Point, uh, let's say 8 on another day the average came out to be let's say 92.27 and you have been doing this thing let's say for last one month so let's say on day 30 so i'll just put dot 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 in this in this table on day 30 the average came out to be 92.66 now when you looked at the month average the complete month average the monthly average was 92.84 now this is what has been given to us so another day let's say another month another day when you were testing 40 new milk packet 40 new milk packets your average came out to be 92.67 so i hope this this complete picture is making sense you have been doing the test for all the days from day 1 to day 30 from last one month and the average was 92.84 and this is let let's say you can say that this is above the quality uh, above the quality cut off but on one particular day after testing this 40 new milk packets the average came out to be 92.67 now you want to perform the test to check if this number the new mean the new sample mean is in the significance range or is is this number is 92.67 is statistically significant or is statistically same as 92.84 or not so what we want to test is 92.67 is statistically same as 92.84 or not this is what we want to test so if these two numbers are statistically same then we will approve this this uh, this batch this batch of new 40 milk packets if they are different if they are statistically different we will reject the complete lot 
because the milk content is less than the acceptance. This is what the complete scenario is. Now the number one thing that we will do is to formulate the null and alternate hypothesis. So my alternate hypothesis will be that the average is not equal to 92.84. Why I'm using 92.84 over here because that is my previous or previous proven value. This is my initial value, right? Initial. Now alternate or oh sorry, null will be the average is equal to 92.84. Okay. Now, please remember one thing. Whenever we have a not equal to sign, this basically mean I have to perform the test, uh, which will be our two tail test. So let's quickly understand this part. If I'm having not equal to sign in my alternate hypothesis, then my rejection region. So what is rejection? What is acceptance? We will talk about it. Don't worry. But my rejection will region will be on both the side. So this is my rejection region. This is my rejection region. If I am having less than sign in my alternate hypothesis, then my rejection region will be on left side, this side. So just see the arrows. So the arrow is pointing on the left. So my rejection region is on the left. If I'm having greater than sign in my alternate hypothesis, then my rejection region will be on the right, which is on the this side. So just see the arrow, arrow is pointing towards the right. So my rejection region, region is on the right. Now, since I'm having not equal to sign in my alternate, my, that this particular test would be a two tail test. So this is known as a two tail test. This is known as a left tail. This is known as a right tail test. So this is my two tail test. So my rejection region is on the both end. I'll just highlight it. This is my rejection region. And this is my rejection region. Now, what we are going to do, we are going to find out this particular value, lower value and the upper value. Now, I hope you guys remember that we have already done this using confidence interval estimation in inferential statistic. We have already found out the limit, the lower limit and the upper limit, right? So we have the uh, average, the, so here we call this as a population average. So we have the average plus minus Z times of sigma divided by root of N. Now what is going to be my Z value? Now for that we have to use this significance level. Significance level, also known as alpha, is basically my area of rejection, which is 0 0.05. So out of the complete area, which is one, 0 0.05 is the area of rejection. Now, since I'm having area of rejection or rejection region, these are my rejection regions, rejection region. This is also my rejection region. Since my rejection region is on both the end, I have to divide this significance or area of rejection by two. So 0 0.05 divided by two will be 0 0.025. So from here to here, the area is 0 0.025. From here to here, the area is 0 0.025. Now what is the Z value over here? What is the Z value over here? We already know this but let's quickly find out the Z value at 0 0.025. So 0 0.025 over here and the value is minus 1.9 and 6. Similarly, for the positive side, it will be plus 1.96. So this is minus 1.96 plus 1.96. Now using this, we will find out the 
लोअर वैल्यू एंड अपर वैल्यू सो नाइन्टी टू पॉइंट एट फोर प्लस माइनस वन पॉइंट नाइन सिक्स सिगमा विच इज स्टैंडर्ड डिविजन इज वन पॉइंट नाइन सेवन नाइन डिवाइड बाई रूट ऑफ फोर्टी सो वी विल गेट नाइन्टी टू पॉइंट टू here we will have 92.286 here we will have 93.394 now this is the range in which which has been given to us or which we have derived using the population mean so now if my sample mean this is my sample mean if if my sample mean lies between or maybe in the acceptance range this is my acceptance range acceptance range so if my sample mean lies in the acceptance range we say that we fail to reject null so 92.67 will lie somewhere between this over here since it is lying in the acceptance range so if sample mean lies in acceptance range we conclude that we fail to reject null otherwise if it is in the rejection region if sample mean so i forgot to write mean falls or lies in the rejection region we reject null we reject null so as of now what conclusion we will derive the conclusion will be we fail to reject null why because the sample mean is within the acceptance region or within the boundary which we have derived using the population mean this is also known as the hypothesized mean the reason hypothesized mean is because we hypothetically call it as a population mean but it is not the true population mean so if you are getting confused just be very clear this is a sample mean 92.67 92.84 is my population mean and using the population mean we have derived a range if my sample mean fall within this range we fail to reject null if it is outside the range we reject null i hope this question makes sense if it is not let's take one more example now let's try to solve this particular problem and i would advise all of you to pause this video and try to solve this problem by yourself because we have already seen one example you have to just follow the steps and try to solve this problem and try to pause the video and just try to solve it by yourself i assume that you guys would have solved it by yourself if not let's try to solve it the question says in a certain community a claim is made that the average income of employed individual is 35500 dollars now again there is some initial statement which has already been proven that the average income is 35500 so this is my initial statement initial statement a group of citizens suspect that a value is incorrect and gather a random sample of 140 employed individual in a hope of showing 35500 is not the correct average the mean came out to be 34 325 so what the group of citizens did they collected a sample of 140 people and they obtained the sample mean to be 34 325 with the population standard deviation the population standard deviation so this is not sample standard deviation so here we have been given with the population standard deviation of 4200 dollars the alpha alpha what is alpha the area of rejection area of rejection is given as 0.10 which is 10% now let's start with the formulation of the hypothesis my alternate hypothesis is that the average is not equal to 35500 
बिकॉज थर्टी फाइव फाइव हंड्रेड इज द इनिशियल वैल्यू और इनिशियल स्टेट सो ग्रुप ऑफ सिटीजन वॉन्ट्स टू प्रूव दैट थर्टी फाइव फाइव हंड्रेड इज नॉट द करेक्ट एवरेज सो दैट्स माई ऑल्टरनेट नल विल बी अपोजिट ऑफ दिस मीन इज इक्वल टू थर्टी फाइव फाइव हंड्रेड ना वॉट इज माई सेकेंड स्टेज आई विल फाइंड आउट द लोअर क्रिटिकल वैल्यू एंड द अपर क्रिटिकल वैल्यू सो हेयर इज माई नॉर्मल डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन सिंस आई एम हैविंग नॉट इक्वल टू साइन इन माई ऑल्टरनेट हाइपोथिस इट इज द टू टेल टेस्ट माई एरिया ऑफ रिजेक्शन इज ऑन बोथ द एंड सो दिस इज ऑल्सो एरिया ऑफ रिजेक्शन एंड दिस इज ऑल्सो माई एरिया ऑफ रिजेक्शन now we have to find out the lower critical value and the upper critical value before that we are given with the alpha of 0.10 since i am having rejection region on both the ends my alpha will be divided by 2 so 0.1 divided by 2 so this will be 0.05 from here all the way up to here and this will also be 0.05. So what is the z value over here? Again, we will use the z table. So we have to look at 0.05. So 0.055. Okay, over here. Maybe we can take this one, or maybe this one. So minus 1.64 or 65. You can take any one. So I'll go with minus 1.64. So this is minus 1.64. This is plus 1.64. now i have the z value i have all the values let's calculate the range mean plus minus z times of sigma divided by root of n my mean is uh 35 500 plus minus 1.64 standard deviation is 4200 divided by root of 140 so the range would be 3 4 Nine one seven point seven six comma three six zero eight two point two four. So this value, lower value, is three four nine one seven, and the upper value is three six zero eight two. Now where my sample mean is lying at. Three four three two five. So my three four three two five will lie somewhere over here, right? Three four three two five, in the acceptance region. Since it is falling in the acceptance region, we conclude that we fail to reject null. And that basically means the claim that was made was correct. Which basically means this alternate, or oh sorry, null, is actually true. now i'm just saying we fail to reject null but maybe because the sample size was less or because the sample collection process was was bias due to which the citizens were not able to prove that 35500 is a wrong is a wrong average but as of now using the test result uh, we fail to reject null i hope this makes sense now here we have one more example so we have seen two examples where we used two tail test where the rejection region was on both the end but now let's take one example where i am having a one tail test either left or right so the question says suppose the scores on the sat so sat is one of the examination form a normal distribution with mean 500 and a standard deviation 100 the school counselor has developed a special course designed to boost sat score a random sample of 40 students is selected so we have a sample of 40 students and the sample average came out to be 544 after they have gone through the course and they have attempted the sat examination the question already states that uh the sat score is having a normal distribution with mean 500 and a standard deviation of 
so this is my population parameter you may assume this is these are the population parameters now does the course boost the score does does the course boost the score so my alternate hypothesis is does the average is greater than 500 because if the course boosts the score it should be greater than the population average which is 500 right null is it is less than or equal to 500 right now greater than 500 basically mean uh, it is the arrow is pointing on the right side so it is a right tail test so my rejection region will be on the right end this is my rejection region now now what we have to do again we have to find out the z value over here so let's find out the z value over here now to find out the z value uh, the area of rejection alpha is given as 1% which is 0 0.01 so this area from this point all the way up to the end is 0 0.01 so what is the area from this point all the way up to this point it will be 0 0.99 so now we will use the a, uh, z table to find out the z value at the AUC of 0 0.99 so let's use the z table so 0 0.99 what is the z value so either we can go with this value or this value so this is 2.32 or 2.33 so i'll go with 2.32 so z value is 2.32 and this is plus now let's apply the formula mean plus z times of sigma divided by root of n remember the lower value will now be minus infinity we have to just find the upper value so mean is 500 plus 2.32 sigma is uh, which is the standard deviation is 100 so this will come out to be 36.6 so the total is 536.6 so this value over here is 536.6 now where my sample mean is lying at my sample mean was 544 544 will lie on this side right on the rejection side this side so this will be 544 so since my uh, since my sample mean is lying at the rejection region we conclude that we reject null so if i reject null that basically means the course does increase the SAT score. The course does increase the SAT score. Now, please remember this statement is based on this particular sample. I am not saying it will always inc increase the SAT score. Based on this sample, the conclusion is that course does increase the SAT score but it might be because of some, some uncertainty it might be because when we were when we were selecting the students we have only selected uh, the intelligent students with higher IQ and that is the reason we obtained the average which is greater than the population average so it might be because of the uncertainty also also so that is the reason we say we reject null we are not saying we accept alternate we will not say that i hope now the thing is making more sense so now let's talk about t test we have already seen a uh, z test in very much detail we have solved three problems now let's talk about t test and before we jump into solving few problems using t test let's first of all understand when to use a t-test so we have already talked about z-test now let's write down the conditions for t-test so i will write it over here t-test so we use t-test condition number one when the number of observations in the sample is less than 30 so the number of observations is less than 30 this is my first check the second check is 
population standard deviation is unknown the third check is the sample has been taken out from a population which is known to be normally distributed the sample has been taken out from a population which is known to be normally distributed now what is the meaning of the sample has been taken out from a population which is known to be normally distributed so let's say i take example of income i know that in india the income is normally distributed now if i take a sample of five people now this sample will satisfy the t test t test parameters because i know that it has been taken out from a population which is normally distributed the number of observations in the sample are less than 30 and the pop population standard deviation is unknown so i don't know what is the standard deviation of the income in my indian population because the population is really large right so before we apply t test we have to check these conditions we have to check these parameters now let's solve a problem to understand this as i have already told you that t test can be performed or there are three types of t test based on the problem statement so let's try to understand them very briefly about what kind of problem statement satisfy which kind of t test now there can be three type of t test one sample t test paired sample t test and finally the independent sample t test so regarding one sample t test we try to compare the mean of single group with known mean now if it is not making sense don't worry we will when we will be solving a problem then i'll better explain you this paired sample t test here we compare the mean of the same group at two time or uh, two time two different time so at two different time in independent sample t-test we compare the mean of two different groups now if it is not making sense don't worry we will take example of each one of them and then it will make more sense let's start with one sample t-test so a, a ds lawn service advertise that they can maintain your lawn at an average cost of 35 dollars per month now this is what their uh, proven value is the initial value that they have given uh, assume the cost to be normally distributed now this is a very important sentence the population is normally distributed that has been given to us a random sample of 18 ds customers shows the average of 32.50 so we have taken a sample the sample is having the mean of 32.50 and the sample standard deviation to be 18.10 now we know that this sample has been taken from a population from a population in which the cost was normally distributed cost was normally distributed so first of all let's check 
whether this question or this particular problem satisfies the condition of t-test or not. The very first condition is the number of observations in the sample should be less than 30. Here my n is 18. So yes, first condition is satisfied. Second condition is the population standard deviation is unknown. Yes, we do not know the population standard deviation, but we know the sample standard deviation. And the third one is the sample has been taken out from the population which is normally distributed. So this particular sample has been taken out from a population where the cost was normally distributed. So all the three conditions are satisfied. Let's try to see the procedure now. Number one, we have to formulate the hypothesis. So my alternate hypothesis would be that the average average cost is less than 35. So this is what we want to test. So average is less than 35. Null will be average is greater than or equal to 35. So this is my null and alternate hypothesis. Again, since I am having less than sign in my alternate, it is a lower tail test. So lower tail test. Now we will find out the T critical. Now T critical formula is similar to Z value x minus mu divided by sigma divided by root of n. I hope you guys remember the z value formula when we were talking when we were talking about the z scaling. The z value formula was x minus mean divided by sigma. Now here I am using sigma divided by root of n is because this distribution is a sampling distribution and the and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is given as sigma divided by root of n according to the central limit theorem, right? Now what is x? x is my uh, sample mean which is 32.50, mu is my population mean which is 35 divided by sigma 18.10 divided by root of 18. What is the value? You guys can quickly calculate it. I have already calculated it. So this will be minus 1.30. Sorry, there is a one um, one correction, this is not T critical, this will be T estimated, T E. So T estimated is 1 minus 1.30. Now we will find out the T critical, which is calculated using the T table. And T table requires your alpha, which is given as, so okay, I haven't written alpha, so let's assume alpha to be 0 0.05. So alpha is 0 0.05 and degree of freedom. Now degree of freedom is given as n minus 1. But what is degree of freedom? What is degree of freedom? So let's understand degree of freedom. Now let's say there are three people. One, two, and three. These are the three people and let's say these are A, B and C and this is Sumit. Now what I have, uh, what I'm asking A, B, C to do, I'm asking A, B, C to choose one number in such a way that the total is 10. Now let's say so let's write down A, B, C and the total. Now we already know that the total in all the cases would be equal to 10. So let's say A has chosen 5, B has chosen 3. Then C is bound to choose 2. Let's say A has chosen 5 b has chosen 5 then c is bound to choose 0 let's say a has chosen 1 b has chosen 1 then c is bound to choose 8 now you here you guys can see that the third component or the third data point in my in my summation is not free to choose a value when we already know the total so there are only two values a and b which are free to choose any value of their choice but c is always bound c is always bound to choose a value that is left out so degree of freedom talks about 
how many observations in your data are free to choose a value the number of observations in the data in the data that are free to choose a value now here since we know the sample average since we already know the sample average the degree of freedom will always be n minus 1 because there will be always one value who which will be bound uh, to choose a value that can make the average to come out to be what we are given with so here degree of freedom will be n minus 1 n is 18 so 18 minus 1 is 17 now we will use the t table with these two parameters to find out the t critical value so let's use the t table so this is a one tail test uh, with the significance of 0 0.05 and the degree of freedom to be 17 so here so correct value is minus 1.740 so T, t, t critical is minus 1.740 now I'll, I'll quickly delete this because I do not have to write this first first of all we will write the t critical minus 1.740 now where this minus 1.30 will lie t estimate t estimate will lie let's say so minus 1.3 minus 1.3 will lie over here right so this is my this is my rejection region this is my rejection region which is below the t critical value and my t estimated is beyond beyond the t, t critical so this is the boundary t critical and this is my t estimate now since t estimate is on the acceptance side we say that we fail to reject null which basically means that uh, uh, this statement it is greater than or equal to 35 that basically means those people or those people who were uh, doubting who were having the doubt regarding this ds lawn service they were actually correct that based on this sample we can conclude that uh, the average cost that uh, this DS lawn service uh, charges for maintaining a lawn is not uh, 35 or less than 35 it is more than 35 I hope this is making sense this was uh, one sample t-test one sample t-test now the reason it was one sample t-test is because we have one group we have a known mean which is 35 and we are comparing the sample mean with the known mean so this is one sample t-test now in the paired sample t-test this is this is the example of paired sample t-test here we compare the average of one group at two different time so here you can see that we have before result and after result let's try to solve this problem to better understand this so here in this question we are given with uh, the, the problem statement states that a study was conducted to determine the effectiveness of a weight loss program the table shows before and after weight of 10 individuals does the program was affecting in, in reducing the weight we have to test at a significance of 5% now if we logically think about this question the program will be called effective when the difference what is the difference after minus before when the difference is negative so let's calculate the difference I have already calculated it so I'll just fill the table so 169 minus 185 minus 16 minus 5 minus 
थर्टीन माइनस वन माइनस थर्टी वन प्लस थ्री माइनस ट्वेंटी एट माइनस ट्वेंटी टू प्लस फाइव एंड माइनस ट्वेंटी थ्री नाउ दीज आर द डिफरेंसेस इफ दिस डिफरेंस इज नेगेटिव दैट बेसिकली मीन्स द पर्सन ऑप्टेंड और द पर्सन अचीव्ड द वेट लॉस इफ इट इज पॉजिटिव दैट मीन्स द पर्सन अचीव्ड द वेट गेन सो इफ आई लुक एट दिस ऑब्जर्वेशन इंडिविजुअल नंबर सिक्स द पर्सन वॉज हैविंग अ वेट ऑफ वन सिक्सटी एट इट इंक्रीज टू वन सेवेंटी वन सो द पर्सन गेन्ड वन थ्री थ्री यूनिट्स ऑफ वेट वाइल दिस पर्सन हुज वेट वॉज टू हंड्रेड एंड एटीन नॉट केम टू वन नाइन्टी फाइव सो दिस इंडिविजुअल अचीव्ड ए लॉस इन द वेट ऑफ ट्वेंटी थ्री यूनिट्स नाउ आई विल कॉल दिस प्रोग्राम इफेक्टिव एट द एवरेज डिफरेंस इज बिलो जीरो राइट बिलो जीरो मीन्स नेगेटिव सो माई ऑल्टरनेट माई नल ऑल्टरनेट हाइपोथिस विल बी द एवरेज इज लेस देन जीरो बिकॉज इनिशली आई विल कंसिडर दैट द प्रोग्राम इज नॉट इफेक्टिव इनिशली आई विल कंसिडर दैट द प्रोग्राम इज नॉट इफेक्टिव सो इनिशियल स्टेटमेंट विल बी द एवरेज इज आई दर ग्रेटर देन और इक्वल टू जीरो so i assume that this is a number line uh, of differences d where uh if my average average difference is zero or above this is zero or positive then my program is not effective if it is negative then pro my program is effective so these are my null and alternate hypothesis now what we have to do this is my sample so i need the sample mean so mu x my average of differences so i'll just write mu d the average of differences i have already calculated it you guys can use excel for this quick calculation so the average difference is minus 13.1 and the standard deviation of the sample is 13.02 this is my sample statistic now i will calculate the t estimate t estimate is x minus mean divided by sigma divided by root of n my x is um, minus 13.1 my am i 13.1 population mean is 0 population mean is 0 which we have assumed that there is no change there is no gain there is no loss 0 sigma is 13.02 Divide by root of n. N is ten. Now this will came out to be minus three point one eight. Now using the alpha, which is five percent, so zero point zero five, and degree of freedom, which is n minus one, which is ten minus one, which is nine, I will find out the t critical using the t table. So let's quickly do this. so degree of freedom so this is a one tail test significance level 0.05 degree of freedom to be 9 so here we have the value 1.833 1.833 now since it is a lower tail test because i am having lower sign or less than sign so the value t critical will be let's say this t critical is minus 1.833 now where this minus 3.18 will lie minus 3.18 will lie over here t estimate now since it is lying on the rejection region we conclude that we reject null which basically mean uh which basically means yes based on this sample the uh program was actually found effective so yes based on this sample the program was found to be effective now here you can see that the reason we call this as a paired sample t test is because we were having the same group 
but at two day two different time before and after same set of people before and after so paired sample t test we are we are comparing their average or the average difference now we have independent sample t test which basically means now we have two different group group a group b and we have to compare them so let's see this example so this is the example of independent sample t test and in this particular test we are having two different group now if you read the question it says let's consider an example where we want to compare the effectiveness of two different study techniques uh, 30 random students are selected they were divided into two groups group a was subjected to technique a group b was subjected to technique b now please remember uh, I am having total number of students to be 30 where uh, we have divided them into two equal groups. So that basically means group A consists of 15 students, group B consists of 15 students, group A consists of 15 different students, group B consists of different students. So the, these, two, these two groups are not having any association between them. They are two different groups. Now I want to compare whether is technique A and technique B, whether they are same or different. That's what my test is, whether they are same or whether they are different. So my alternate hypothesis will be average of A is not equal to average of B. My null hypothesis will be average of A is equal to average of B. So my null hypothesis is that I'm initially assuming that these two techniques are same where what I want to prove that these two techniques are different so that's my null and alternate alternate hypothesis now we will follow the same procedure but there will be a minute difference in the t estimate the formula for t estimate is x1 average minus x2 average minus mu1 minus mu2 divided by square root of sigma 1 square divided by n1 plus sigma 2 square divided by n2. So here in my table I am already given with mu1 and mu2. So let's fill that table, uh, fill this formula. Mu1 is 84.07 minus 78.23 minus mu1 and mu2 so we are assuming that mu1 is, is equal to mu2 so this will come out to be zero since we are assuming my null hypothesis is that these two average the population average are same so mu1 minus mu2 will always be zero then square root of sigma1 square so 3.87 to the whole square divided by n1 which is 15 plus 2.61 to the whole square divided by 15. If I solve this, we will get 3.02. This is my T estimate. Now, this is a two-tailed test, right? This is a two-tailed test because I'm having not equal to sign my alternate hypothesis. Two-tailed test. We have not given with alpha let's assume alpha to be 0 0.05 so this portion will be 0 0.025 this portion will be 0 0.025 and both are my rejection region now i want to find out t critical which is this point t critical again we have to use alpha which is 0 0.025 and we need degree of freedom. Now in the case of uh, independent sample t-test, the degree of freedom is given as n minus, so degree of freedom is given as n1 plus n2 minus two. So my n1 is 15 plus 15 minus two, which is 27. So I'll be using alpha 0 0.05, sorry, alpha, alpha 0.025, t critical as 
27 to obtain the t critical value using the t table let's do that so i am now in the two tail test and we have to look at 0 0.025 so two tail test uh, alpha is given as 0 0.05 right alpha is given as 0 0.05 uh, we can use so what is my what I have done uh, I have since I have divided it by two in my t table uh, it gives from the left it gives the t critical value from the left so if I go with 0 0.025 from the left it, I will get this value and if I go from this value to this if I have to find out this value it will be 0 0.0 see 0 0.95 so let's use one tail test or if you want to use you can use two tail test at the alpha of 0 0.05 we can use any of one, one of them uh, for avoiding any confusion let's use two tail test at the alpha of 0 0.05 so let's look into that so two tail test alpha is 0 0.05 and we are given degree of freedom as 27 this is 2.052 so my t critical is minus 2.052 and this will be plus 2.052 right because always they are complementary to each other 3.02 where this will lie 3.02 will lie somewhere over here on this rejection region this is t estimate since it is lying on the rejection region we say that we reject null and when we reject null basically mean they are not same they are different so based on this particular sample we conclude that these two techniques are different from each other so based on this sample we conclude that these two techniques are different from each other this is what independent sample t-test is now we have completed our discussion on hypothesis testing so we have talked about how we can perform so we started our discussion with uh, how to formulate the hypothesis then we talked about the two type kind of test z test and t test within z test we looked at two methods z value method p value method within t test we looked at the various types of test which are based on various types of problem statements one sample t test uh, paired sample t-test, independent sample t-test and we solved a variety of problems also to make our understanding more concrete, right? Now we are going to talk about a topic which is known as error in hypothesis testing. As I talked initially that there might be some uncertainty that my test goes wrong, right? Since this is a test which we are performing on the sample, we can never be 100% sure that what result my test is providing us or the conclusion that we made from the test is always going to be 100% true. Let's say uh, my test concluded that uh, uh, we reject null or let's take one example. In this particular example, we have rejected null, right? What if this was actually not true? So based on these two samples, we concluded that we reject null. But what if in reality, overall, so as of now, we have taken a sample of 15, 15 students. And just because of the sample of 15, 15 students, we concluded that we reject null. But what if in reality, if I take a much bigger sample in reality, this, this is not true. 
this is not true both techniques happen to be same then that is known as the error in hypothesis testing so how we can avoid this error before we can avoid this error we have to be very much clear with what kind of error hypothesis testing can lead us or what kind of errors we can encounter while performing hypothesis testing let's try to understand that now before we talk about uh, this particular problem so i have written one condition or i have written one problem statement let's try to summarize what are the various error we can encounter while performing hypothesis testing so we can summarize the type of error in a uh, two cross two matrix this is the reality and this one is the test result or hypothesis test result hypothesis test result now there can be four type of scenarios so in reality the null hypothesis was true so h not was true and h not was false here we rejected h not and we failed to reject h not now when h not was false and we rejected h not this is a good thing right so this is my correct conclusion so i'll write correct over here this is correct when my h not was true and we failed to reject h not this is also correct now where is the error error is in these two cases when my h not was true in reality so in reality let's say in reality uh, i know that the program is not effective so in reality program is not effective but based on the uh, based on the sample we concluded that program is effective so this is a wrong estimation or wrong result so this is known as the type 1 error type 1 error and this is represented by alpha so alpha which is area of rejection in all the questions that we have solved is basically the probability of type 1 error what is the probability that i will commit the type 1 error is is basically given by alpha and this is known as the type 2 error when when your h not was false so in reality my null hypothesis was wrong so in reality let's say uh in reality let's say the program is not effective so in reality let's say program is effective and we fail to reject h not so we concluded that this program is not effective that's a type 2 error if this is confusing you a lot don't worry now let's look into examples let's look into this example city had an unemployment rate of 9% so what is my null hypothesis my null hypothesis is that the city had an unemployment rate of 9% group of citizen thinks that the unemployment rate is different from 9% so alternate is average is not equal to 9% null is average is equal to 9% this is my null and alternate hypothesis now if i commit type 1 error then what will be the case so type 1 error means h not is true in reality but we reject h not so what is the meaning of this so in reality unemployment rate was 9% but we concluded that it's not 9% we rejected h not right what is type 2 error 
in this case type 2 error will be that in reality unemployment rate was not 9% but we concluded that it was 9% so we failed to reject null we failed to reject null means we concluded that the unemployment rate is 9% but in reality it was not 9% now, as of now, I'm not talking about which one is good, which one is bad. I'm just talking about how to identify the type one and type two error. Just remember that you, you have to just uh, keep this particular table or this matrix in your, in your head so that you can formulate type one error and type two error. Let's take one more example. A city had a city plan to construct a new parking area. They plan to survey a sample to see if there is a strong evidence that the proportion is interested in new parking area. If it is more than 40%, then the government will consider building a new parking area. So the, if, the, if the proportion, uh, so let's say government has taken a sample of different, different uh, individuals from the population. And if this sample uh, results in 40% 40 40% 40 uh, interested so let's say 40% of the people in this sample are interested in the new parking area in the city then the government will propose a new parking area in the city so what is the null and alternate hypothesis so my alternate hypothesis is that the average is greater than 40% because this is what we were trying to prove null is the average is less than or equal to 40%. So initially my assumption is that no one is interested. My initial assumption is no one is interested. I'm trying to prove that uh, more than 40% people are interested in the sample. Now what is my type 1 error? Type 1 error is basically reject H0 when H0 is actually true, actually true. So type 1 error will be uh, reject H0. We will reject H0 basically mean uh, we concluded that, we concluded that more than 40% people in the sample or in the population are interested are interested for the new parking area while in reality in reality uh, less than 40% people were interested. So this is my type 1 error. What is type 2 error? Type 2 error is basically we fail to reject H0, fail to reject H0 when H0 was actually false. So what is the conclusion for this? We failed to reject H0. So we concluded, we concluded that less than 40% people are interested for the new parking area, for the new parking area while in reality, in reality, H0 was actually false. So in reality, more than 40% people 
people were interested now if i ask you if let's say you are a government body and you are performing this test which particular error is more problematic for you as a government body as a government body type 2 error you can see that it is problematic for us because we have concluded that uh, less than 40% people are interested in the new parking area which basically mean we will not build the new parking area so the uh, the consequence of the type 1 error would be government will choose not to build the new parking area when it was actually required parking area when it was actually required so what is the end problem for this or major consequence that will happen to the government well people will not be happy with the government right so people will not be happy with the government right what is the consequence of type 1 error now the consequence of type 1 error is that the government will build the new parking area when it is not required so government will end up building the new parking area when it is not required and what is the consequence that government will will be uh, facing government will be investing some unnecessary amount from their budget in building up this new parking area which will impact their budget so impact their in, impact in their budget now as a government body you need to decide which particular error you want to reduce because see since we are doing hypothesis testing since we are doing estimations we cannot be free from error there will there will be some kind of error but you have to decide which error you are ready to bear or which error is less problematic for you so if you are a government body you have to decide whether you are ready to face the impact in your budget or whether you are ready to face uh, that people will not be happy with you well if i would be a government i would not be um, taking up the type 2 error on me because i want my people to be happy so i would do something with the budget i would try to maybe cancel some ongoing projects or maybe cancel some new projects but i don't want my people to be unhappy with the government right let's take one more example to understand how we can adjust the alpha because we know the alpha value right we can tweak the alpha value we can increase or decrease the alpha value to increase the chances of type 1 error and reduce the chance of type 2 error so you can you can assume that uh, if we are if i am having a number line then if i want type 1 error to be high i can increase the value of alpha and it will eventually reduce the type 2 error the chances of type 2 error it is like a number line you can shift it let's see one last example so employee at a hotel perform daily water tank quality test okay uh, to check if the water quality is good for the people to take bath and use it for toilet based on the test result water supply is stopped for 3 or 4 hours for the to perform the cleaning process or for the cleaning process if the test result are positive the water supply is not stopped test at alpha of 0.05 Now in this question, we are provided with the alpha of zero point zero five. What is the alternate hypothesis? Let's uh, you guys can pause the video, think about it, and then you can uh, maybe comment on the chat section. So now let's try to understand this question, and I hope you guys would have already guessed uh, what is going to be the alternate and the null null hypothesis. 
my null hypothesis would be that the water quality is fine. So water quality is fine, is good, fine or good. My null would be, sorry, my alternate would be water quality is not good, right? Now what is the type 1 error? The type 1 error is basically that we reject H0 when it was, so let's write it down, we reject H0 when H0 was actually true in reality, right? So what is the meaning of this? We reject H0, so we rejected that water quality is fine when H0 was actually true. So what will happen? So we will close the close the water supply will close the water supply when it was not required right what is type 2 error type 2 error is we fail to reject H0 when H0 was actually false. So what will be the uh, consequence for this? So we failed to reject H0. So which basically means we concluded that the water quality is good when H0 was actually false. So that basically means we will uh, not close the pool or we will not close the water supply or maybe we uh, let's not write we let's write the water supply was not stopped water supply was not stopped when the water quality was bad water quality was bad or not good now which one is more problematic? So if you are a hotel owner, then which one is more problematic for you? So if I go with the type 1 error, we have to close the water supply when it was not required, which basically means uh, we will clean or your, your employee or the uh, maybe your uh, the, the, the people who clean the tank, they will perform the cleaning process, but there will be a stoppage of water supply for three to four hours. Maybe this is not a big problem because maybe you can decide the window of afternoon and then the water supply can be stopped for three to four hours and it will not impact the, the service, right? So when you have to stop the water supply, you have to also think that uh, it may impact the service, but it will eventually not going to harm you uh, in a very large scale because you can choose the window in the afternoon when most of the people are either out of the hotel or maybe uh, involved in some other activities they would not be using the uh, the bathroom right what is the consequence of type 2 error water supply was not stopped when the water quality was bad now this is a more problematic condition let's say somebody is having a sensitive uh, skin and that person is staying in your hotel. And if you do not clean the water, and let's say that person has taken bath in the contaminated water, the person can attract some kind of disease, which can eventually land your hotel into a big problem, right? So type two error is definitely very problematic for you. Now we have already learned that alpha is the probability of type 1 error. So alpha is the probability of committing type 1 error. So now if I increase the value of alpha, there are more chances that I will commit type 1 error. But 
it will reduce the chances of type 2 error. So right now my alpha value is 0.05. If I increase this to 0.10, then what happened? I increased the probability of type 1 error. So let's say this is type 1 error. I increase the prob probability of type 1 error. So it will reduce the probability of type 2 error. And this is what you should do. So why we were talking about this particular topic? As a data scientist, let's say you are performing hypothesis testing. It is very important for you to carefully decide the value of alpha. And you can only decide the correct value of alpha by understanding the consequence of type of error. So let's say in this particular condition, if you are the data scientist working for this hotel chain, then you would eventually use the value of alpha to, to be on the higher side so that the probability of committing type 2 error can be lowered down and uh, it is fine if I commit type 1 error because as we have already seen the type 1 error is something which is manageable but type 2 error is something which is not manageable. I hope this makes sense. So this was all about this particular video. I hope this module was informative and really useful for all of you. If you like this video, share it with your friends, give this video a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to our Scalers YouTube channel.